1996 was a dark year for the Italian Stallion. Sylvester Stallone had had two pricey flops in 1995, Judge Dredd and Assassins, and his Christmas of 1996 disaster movie release Daylight didn't do much better. It was another box office bomb. Just a few years before, Stallone had made a major comeback with Cliffhanger and Demolition Man, but now the whole industry was changing. Carolco, the company that financed some of the biggest hits of the era, had gone bankrupt, and action movies were getting smaller and smaller. Arnold Schwarzenegger was on the decline, and Eraser was a smaller hit than usual. Jean-Claude Van Damme and Steven Seagal were just a few years away from making direct-to-video movies, and the new hot action star was Nicolas Cage, with The Rock and Con Air, who's definitely more of a low-key, down-to-earth type of action hero, at least in that era. Most of the time, I work in a glass jar and lead a very uneventful life. I drive a Volvo, a beige one. What was Sly to do? The result is one of his very best movies, Copland, as we explore in this episode of Sylvester Stallone Revisited. I look at this town, and I don't like what I see anymore. Who the fuck do you think you are? You know what they call a, a, a quarter pounder with cheese uh, in Paris? They don't call it a quarter pounder with cheese? Oh, man, they got the metric system. They wouldn't know what the fuck a quarter pounder is. And what do they call it? They call it the uh, Royale with cheese. In the 1990s, one of the biggest stars on the planet was Sylvester Stallone's former protege, John Travolta. In 1983, Stallone had directed him in Staying Alive, a movie that reformed his Saturday Night Fever anti-hero into a kind of quasi-Rocky, and Stallone literally re-sculpted the actor's physique in his own image. While a hit, Travolta's career had faltered badly in the 80s and early 90s. The only movies of his people would actually go to see were the Look Who's Talking movies where Travolta had to play second banana to Bruce Willis's talking baby. Even that franchise had petered out when the kids started to be able to talk themselves and they ended up using the talking gimmick on animals. Nice cushy thing to sleep on, a little lumpy. Maybe I'll just dig the crap out of the middle. His career was such a joke that The Simpsons aired this brutal dig. It is the 70s, right down to the smallest detail. Hey, the bartender even looks like John Travolta. Yeah, looks like. Yet, he had the last laugh when he signed on to do a low-budget indie called Pulp Fiction for this guy named Quentin Tarantino. Overnight, Travolta was propelled back to the A-list and had a whole string of hits. Stallone's career was in the dumps, so he opted to do what Travolta did and turn his attention to the indie world. By this point, indies were all the rage thanks to a company called Miramax, run by a fellow you may have heard of called Harvey Weinstein. To be honest, Miramax's movies could scarcely be called indies, as Disney owned the company and Harvey Scissorhands, as he was known to be, was more controlling than even the most hardcore studio exec. But the movies were good and had a way of relaunching careers and even winning Oscars. Copland was written by young James Mangold. At the time, he was considered a rising talent, with his film Heavy earning solid reviews. His script centered around a small New Jersey town populated almost exclusively by dirty cops, all of whom run the town as the little fiefdom. The NYPD's internal affairs knows they're crooked, but the crew is out of their reach. The only law in Copland is the lazy, depressed sheriff named Freddy, who was the town's golden boy, but lost his chance of becoming a cop after he went deaf in one ear, saving the town's beauty queen from a car wreck. From risking yourself, from saving her sorry ass, you go deaf as a result. In one ear. In one ear. Then you have to watch as this girl you saved, this, this beauty queen, marries this cocksucker. And you with your ear, you can't even get a desk on the force. Right? You're fucked. Freddy hero worships the cops and lets them do whatever they want. But when one of them is involved in the shooting that triggers the attention of the NYPD, Freddy is approached and asked to help bust these notorious cops. There isn't much here for you to do, to keep your mind busy. But I look at you, Sheriff, and I see a man who's waiting for something to do. And here I am. Here I am saying, Sheriff, I got something for you to do. Where will his allegiance lie? with his so-called cop buddies who've made him their puppet, or with the law. The lead role of Sheriff Freddy was widely coveted, with John Travolta and Tom Hanks both linked to the part. Eventually, the notion was struck to cast Stallone in what would be his first straight-up drama since Fist in 1979. The role would call for him to gain weight, and his involvement in the movie was heavily hyped, with the buzz being that this would do for him what Pulp Fiction had done for John Travolta. While the movie had a low budget and never worked for scale, Miramax was able to assemble something of a dream cast for the movie, 
Harvey Keitel would play the movie's villain, Ray Donlin, the most senior cop in town and the one who coordinates all the scams with his number two, Jack, played by Robert Patrick. Michael Rappaport would play his sniveling nephew, Murray, who kills an unarmed black man in a drive-by shooting, sparking the investigation into the town. Peter Berg, who is still a year away from making his directorial debut with Very Bad Things, would also be in it along with many future members of the Sopranos cast, including Edie Falco, Annabella Ciora, and Frank Pizent. Plus, there was Jeanine Garofalo, character actor John Spencer, Kathy Moriarty, and the late Ray Liotta in one of the movie's juiciest roles, as Figsy, the coked-up crooked cop who surprisingly serves as the movie's conscience and is Freddy's only real friend. Don't shut me out, Ray! You found us a sweet little town, you got us a low interest, and I'm grateful. But don't forget who it was that you came to two years ago to cover your ass. Get him out of here, Freddy! The biggest casting coup would be Robert De Niro, who signed on to play a key role as internal affairs detective Mo Tilden. And the film would reunite best buds Harvey Keitel and Robert De Niro for the first time since 1984's Falling in Love. Sounds great, right? So what brings you to our fair city? Checking up on us? I heard it was a way of life out here. Thought I'd check it out for myself. What happened to Copland? is strange, as the film was successful, but for some reason, it did absolutely nothing for Stallone's career. How do you think this looks? Go on, Freddy. And don't think so much. In the summer of 1997, Sly was everywhere, with him poking fun at himself by hosting Saturday Night Live, while everyone called this his comeback. So, so how do you think I'm doing? I mean, I, it's... You're stinking up the joy drug! <laughs> It was the movie that was supposed to finally put him on the same level as Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, and it actually did quite well at the box office, earning $44 million domestically, which made it Sly's biggest hit in years. Yet, it wasn't the cultural phenomenon Pulp Fiction was. I offered you a chance when we could have done something. I offered you a chance to be a cop, and you blew it! And critics were shockingly cool on the flick, with many knocking Sly's performance, although his notorious enemy, the Razzies, had the good taste not to nominate him. You gotta hit the next five to win. Shit. The movie really didn't do a thing for Stallone's career, who would go on to make the slasher film Detox next, as well as two more flops, Driven and the Get Carter remake, before taking a long break from the big screen. It all ended well enough for Sly, but Copland became something of a footnote. What's the deal? If you've seen Copland, you'll know that it really is one of Stallone's best movies, and his performance in this is great. Why is it you never got married, Freddy? All the best girls are taken. However, it's a small character-driven drama and not the genre-changing behemoth that Pulp Fiction was. James Mangold has always been interested in westerns and Copland is very much a modern-day version, with Stallone the cowardly sheriff who shows courage in the end and becomes a hero. I can't hear you, Ray. It's a morality tale and a good one at that. Mangold's movie is stylish with some great Bruce Springsteen tracks on the soundtrack and a whole bunch of great performances. One thing worth noting is how Ray Liotta all but steals the movie as the half-crazed cokehead Biggs. You're kind of led to believe that he'll be the movie's big bad guy as he's coded as such, with Liotta playing him disheveled with the same kind of crazy look in his eyes that he had in the last act of Goodfellas. I got a check in my pocket for $200,000. I got a chance to start my life again. I don't give a shit about this town. I don't give a shit about that town. And I don't give a shit about your fucking justice. Being right is not a bulletproof vest, Freddy! Yet, Figsy turns out to be the one guy Freddy can rely on, with him sacrificing his career, and most likely his freedom, to save his pal from Keitel's army of crooked cops. In the end, he does the right thing. Come on, Freddy. All in all, Copland, while not a big hit for Sly, is one of the movies of his that will always stand the test of time. In fact, it gets better the more you watch it, and for me, it's one of my favorite Stallone movies, which is why I give it a 9 out of 10. But, as explained earlier, things were about to get a lot darker for Sly before dawn would break and the Italian stallion would be triumphant once more. My jurisdiction ends in a sense at the George Washington Bridge. But half the men I watch live beyond that bridge where no one's watching. I'm watching. 